Welcome, everybody. Our first speaker today is Bura Özdemir. Uh, Bura is a trained biologist and bioimage analyst. He has worked before at the University of Heidelberg and Freiburg uh, before he started as an image data specialist at Eurobioimaging. Uh, he's also been involved in the EOSC Future Project, and today he will talk to us about his work on development of the OME ZAR uh, formats. Uh, Following Bura, we'll have Joel Luti talking to us today. Uh, Joel is a passionate bioimage analyst and open source software developer. Uh, having previously worked at the University of Zurich and FMI Basel, he has recently moved back uh, to the newly established BioVision Center, uh, which is dedicated to activities related to computer vision and advanced image processing of complex bioimage datasets. All right, so we're really looking forward to the talks, and I think Pura will be the one starting uh, the session. So, Pura, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. We're looking forward. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I am going to start by uh, providing uh, a background information uh, into the uh, OMSR format. So what's the motivation uh, behind uh, development of uh, this uh, relatively new uh, file format? And uh, then I will uh, continue by... Uh, by introducing a few uh, useful tools that uh, that can allow one to start directly working with the uh, OEMISAR format using some uh, short uh, video demonstrations. So what's OEMISAR? Uh, OEMISAR is one of the next generation uh, file formats. Uh, so uh, these are uh, out outcome of the efforts to uh, standardize uh, imaging file formats. And as you know, traditionally the, the standard format has been OEMITIF. So it is a TIFF-based uh, file format uh, with metadata following the uh, OME data model. And OME, OME TIFF has been a success. So it's also supported by the, uh, by the powerful bioformats library, which can uh, convert over 150 uh, file formats into this OME, OME TIFF format. And uh, it also found large uh, community support and uh, it has been uh, quite uh, widely known and used so far. But it also has this uh, limitation, especially with a large high dimensional uh, image data that uh, the, the plane based access imposed by the TIFF container uh, leads to performance drop with uh, large multi dimensional data, especially when this data is uh, remotely stored. So this, uh, this is the main reason, uh, main uh, motivation uh, behind uh, developing new file formats that can overcome uh, this issue. And uh, one of these is OEMISAR. So uh, it is a cloud optimized uh, format. So it offers better access performance, especially when the data is uh, remotely stored, for instance, in an S3 object store. And it's also a multi file storage. Uh, so it's basically not a single file, but a hierarchy of uh, files and directories. So it also offers uh, support for multi resolution data, so called image pyramids, and uh, also a standard layout for raw data. Uh, metadata and derived data, such, such as segmentation, uh, masks, and image analysis results. So here is a recent uh, technology feature. Uh, it's a nice read to learn more about, like this standardization uh, process. So there are these two fundamental features of OEMISAR, uh, which basically uh, give it this uh, better access performance. So one is that the, the the chunked storage of uh, image data. So this is in contrast with the plane based uh, storage offered by so-called monolithic uh, file formats. And the other is the native support for uh, storing the resolution pyramids. So these multiple uh, pyramids, uh, the multiple resolution layers belonging to the uh, same image are stored in different uh, directories in the OEMISA hierarchy. So here's an example uh, to explain better. Uh, so how this chunking uh, helps with better access performance. So if you imagine that you have a 3D image and you want to access this oblique slice, uh, not uh, not the, so out of the entire uh, volume, you just need this oblique slice, and you normally just need single uh, lines of pixels at each plane, each x y plane. But since it is not possible to access subsets of pixels in the in the TIFF uh, in the uh, X Y planes of TIFF, you just need to read the entire planes. So at the end, you just this is the amount of data that you are reading. And uh, if this uh, with the chunked file formats such as OEMISAR, 
then it is possible to actually uh, just read these chunks that correspond to those uh, single lines of pixels. So it is, as you see, then this is the amount of data that, that's being read. And uh, then the next question is, why do we need uh, such resolution pyramids? So uh, if you imagine that you have a memory as large as this box, then uh, you have data that's way larger than that. For example, this is a real data that's eight terabyte size uh, stored in an S3 bucket. And you, you want to actually have a look at the entire volume. Uh, then uh, it's not possible, of course, to read it. But if you have multiple resolution layers, then the viewer can automatically adjust to one of the uh, lower resolution layers. So it just will search and find the largest uh, image that fits into, into the memory, for example. Then you can actually have a look at the entire view. But if you want to also uh, like get more, uh, de more detail, more resolution, then you can simply zoom into a smaller uh, subsection of this uh, plane. And then the viewer will again like adjust to the higher resolution layers and you will be able to see the greater detail. So in, in the both cases, you have actually more or less similar size data and it will not uh, like uh, be higher than the memory limit. So you will never saturate the memory. This is also a principle that's used uh, by uh, uh, Google Maps, for example. And you can find more information about the access performance of OINIZAR in comparison with some other file formats, such as uh, TIFF and HDF5 in this paper, which is a benchmarking uh, study for OINIZAR. Another important uh, uh, thing with OINIZAR is that it, as I said, offers a single layout for, for uh, raw data, metadata, and derived data. And uh, uh, there is a specification for this, for how, uh, for like uh, having this layout, a specific OMSR layout, and also the metadata representations in the different uh, files, uh, these JSON files uh, that you see here. So in, in general, like the top level, you have uh, the directories, different directories for different resolution layers. So this corresponds to high highest resolution, and this then corresponds to the lowest resolution layer. And then inside these directories, you have the actual binary data, so the array data ordered in the form of these uh, nested directories. And if you have like segmentation masks, then they go under this label subdirectory and you have a similar representation for the chunks and uh, different resolution layers here. So uh, this is very important because this specification is then uh, assumed by all these uh, tool development uh, uh, being around the the or the OMSR data, so they have to be uh, uh, they have to be like specific, and otherwise they can uh, deviate from the uh, from the specification, and then it won't be compatible with the different tools. Then uh, the next question is where are we in uh, like community adoption of uh, OMSR? So we already have a bunch of tools. Uh, so in the task categories such as conversion, we have a lot of uh, like uh, file converters now around, and then we have also many viewers. It is not uh, an issue right now to just uh, create an OMSR and visualize it with uh, some of the popular tools such as uh, PG or Napari. Uh, with the image processing, we are maybe not at the same position yet with the other two categories, but uh, there is already like some progress. And after me, for example, Joel will uh, introduce a framework uh, for which is actually capable of uh, image processing and analysis with OMSR data. Another important point for this public adoption is this uh, data repositories uh, who support OMSR, so such as uh, IDR and Bioimage Archive. For instance, there is a recent development in the Bioimage Archive who now internally convert their data into OMSR format, and they also even provide uh, visualization for such data. So these are also important uh, for like public adoption of OMSR in the greater community. And when we talk about the tooling around OMSR, you can actually find uh, this publication, which is a like comprehensive overview of different tools, uh, web services, and lower level libraries that support OMSR data. So it's a good start uh, for, for those who just want to uh, start off with uh, OMSR. So now I will continue with the demo. So uh, these are relatively like introductory demos demonstrations for 
a few like uh, popular tools to work with OMSR data. So I use uh, specifically remote data, so data, exemplary data that is located in a public uh, S3 bucket, but uh, you just know that they can all be replicated with local data as well. So uh, the first one will be just uh, metadata inspection, and then uh, there will be some uh, a demo for the for the converting uh, multiple like images like a collection of images into OMSR also using the remote data and then finally I will show some viewers uh, how you how you can visualize the image data from an S3 bucket. So this is uh, so you normally need to interact with remote uh, data in S3 buckets. For this, you can use one of the various. Uh, existing clients. Uh, one of the good ones, like like uh, the one that's probably easiest to learn because it basically uses uh, Unix commands, is Minio client. And it's compatible with private and public buckets. You just, of course, need to configure it for your specific uh, private S3 bucket with your credentials at the beginning. So I'm not showing this one, but it's also pretty straightforward. So uh, we just start by having a look at what we have in our uh, like uh, example uh, demo directory in, in the S3 bucket that uh, I just mentioned. So uh, this is basically the part. So S3 is just an alias for the URL that I, I have. And then this SEOS feature is the name of the bucket. And this demo is the directory that I just created and populated with this image data with different uh, file formats. So you see that each of them has a different file format. And uh, this tree command is, is especially good that I will show later, especially to see the directory structure of the OMSR. But you also have these other Unix commands like ls, and then you can also see the file sizes. So now that we know what we have there, and we just uh, want to start by creating some OMSRs from these different file formats. For this, we are going to use the tool batch convert that we are developing here at the Eurobioimaging. And it's a wrapper actually around the, uh, the, uh, the lower level uh, converters. So namely bioformats draw for OMSR and uh, DF convert for OMTIF. So it is possible to convert into either of these uh, two file formats using batch convert. The I aim is actually to parallelize this process, the conversion process. And uh, it also has support for local or uh, remote input output options. So input and output can be specified as, as uh, remote parts as well. You just, again, like need to first uh, configure it so that it, it searches the data, uh, the input data in the remote location, or it's, it tries to uh, the output to a remote location. You just need to configure it for this. Supports parallelization also over the Slurm clusters. You, you don't need to create your uh, S, S patch files, but it automatically does it from the command line. And it has two different uh, conversion modes, and you can also specify subsets of files uh, based on the patterns in the file names. So it has different conversion modes. You can, for example, just convert each image to a, to a specific OMSR, or you can group during the conversion process. So then by uh, based on the file, if you just specify this merge files flag, it just uh, considers these different images as part of the same image. So different channel and time, po uh, time points of the same image, and it will convert them by merging them into, into one OMSR or OMT if you specify it that way. And it also recognizes different groups in the input batch. So this is then the command line that we specify. So here, the important thing is to specify these parameters as S3 so that it searches the input part relative to the S3 bucket and writes the output part also relative to the S3 bucket. It's also then uh, possible to provide this uh, a variety of different parameters that you normally can pass to the bioformats row. So in this case, I specify the chunk size as 50. So for width, height, and depth for this particular image, image uh, group, let's say. And then it uh, creates this workflow, an export workflow, where it analyzes the XS3 part, transfers the 
data to the execution environment, so five jobs for five files, and converts them also into OEMISAR in this uh, uh, third process. And finally, it just transfers the data back to the same S3 bucket. So um, then uh, we just, uh, once this is finished, we just uh, have a look again at the, uh, the S3 bucket, uh, so what we have there. Again, using the uh, client. So uh, in this case, I first just used the exam exactly the same command. And now you see that we have this SAR directory created and the, the data converts into the OME ZAR and transferred there. And uh, I won't actually show everything here. I just continue from uh, this point. So now we want to also just see the structure of a single uh, OEMISAR. We just selected this particular image and use the same tree command just to look at the directory uh, structure. And you see that these are these metadata files that I uh, showed you at the beginning. So this SAR array is, so we have two uh, resolution layers apparently for this image. And these are the uh, metadata files storing the array metadata. And then this one, this our attribute file, basically stores metadata about this uh, collection. So the, these two resolution layers. And then we can use the cat command, just like as if it is a lo local file, uh, targeting this our attribute files. And then it basically gives us uh, information such as these, like the order of the dimensionalities and then the, the units, also the scale uh, scales for the particular uh, pixel like particular uh, dimensions time channel that y x and yeah so this is the, the multi scaling uh, metadata so called then we can also same uh, in the same way we can also look at array metadata so here we see the chunk dimensionality and also the, the, the shape of the array for the specific resolution layer so if i can specify this one as one then i can also see the same information for the for the downscale image. So now that we also like uh, uh, had a look at metadata and uh, we see that everything is normal, then we can continue with visualization. So for this, I uh, use two of these uh, popular tools, Fiji and Napari, but there are a bunch of other viewers. There are also these web-based viewers. It's also very interesting. You don't need to basically install any tool. You can just directly use a web API to have a look at your data in the stored in the S3. So, uh, for so in order to use uh, this, uh, have support for OEMISAR in Fiji, you need to first get this uh, Mobi plugin, and it's very straightforward. You just go and go to the update side and get it. Then uh, you can actually open OEMISAR in Big Data Weaver. So. Yeah, just one second. So when you just search the name OEMISAR, you just get these key comments here. You can also find this in the plugins directory. It's just easier this way. Then you can uh, specify one of these. If you want to use uh, visualize local OEMISAR, or if you want to, uh, if you want to view OEMISAR from a private bucket, there you also have to specify credentials. So your URL and your access credentials here. Or finally, you can also choose a choose to view an OEMISAR from a public bucket. This is what I'm going to do. Therefore, I choose that one. Then it will give us a give me a pop-up window like this. I simply put the full path to the S uh, to the OEMISAR that I have, click OK, and then uh, this is it basically. So you just uh, get these two windows. And this one actually also show you the different resolution layers and also the shape of the different resolution layers and also provide you with the, uh, the scaling information. And uh, as you see, it is, so this is not a very big image, but uh, as you see, it is pretty like smooth. You can scroll through the image, you can zoom in and out and you can do things like rotations and whatever that you can do with Big Data Weaver. Um, you can also do this like with very large image data, like uh, terabyte scale data. It's just important that you need to have optimal like chunking and uh, 
resolution uh, layers, like sufficient number of resolution layers. So it is basically a, a trade-off between having too many files or uh, just having the right size to have chunks and enough uh, resolution layers. Then, uh, then this is the Napari, this is the other viewer. So it's also pretty similar. You just uh, need to have this plugin, Napari Oinizar. Basically, I provide you uh, with uh, with some uh, with a link where you, you have instructions for creating an environment from an environment YAML file. There, basically, you have most of these tools. Actually, all of these tools, including Napari Oinizar plugin, and uh, you can directly start using it from that environment. You just specify the plugin as Napari Oinizar and just put this path full path again to the Oinizar that you want to visualize. Then uh, it will again like uh, once you run the command, it will open Napari, and uh, you can basically like uh, do the same things. In Napari, of course, it's also possible to have three D visualization. So uh, also with Oinizar, the three D visualization by default like chooses the lowest uh, resolution image in the pyramid. So this is something that you you should somehow change if you want to see other resolution layers in 3D. Uh, you should do it for, probably from the uh, from the Python code. I just here show uh, for, for simplicity the command line. And uh, yes, this is actually uh, all that I wanted to talk about. Now I will give the floor for, for Joel to pick up from here. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Pua. Um, I'll continue then a bit on the processing front. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel. Um, I'll be talking today about the fractal framework that we are building for processing OMSR imaging data. And before I dive in to the actual framework, um, just one word on the new BioVision Center, because um, Asta has mentioned this in the beginning. Um, I just moved to the BioVision Center, which is uh, joint project between the FMI and the University of Zurich, located in Zurich now. And we're really pushing fair bioimage data analysis and as such are really interested in OMSRs, of course. As the BioVision Center, we have three big areas uh, that we're focusing on. Um, the first one where we're doing the most work at the moment is our BioVision uh, research, innovation and outreach, where it's all about coordinating research and building tools, building open source tools specifically. The second one that we're building towards is being able to offer a lot of those tools as a service as well and run um, a platform for image analysis for our users. And this will be the fractal platform that I'll go into in the next few slides. And the last part is uh, pushing the education in BioVision as well. But with that, uh, you'll find more information on this website here on the BioVision Center. Let's dive into the actual topic for today, which was um, fractal uh, for image processing. So for us, the big question was when we were starting this, um, how do we solve this triangle of challenges uh, in image analysis? And the triangle for us is being able to store terabytes of data amounts um, of image data, being able to visualize the image data, and being able to apply processing to that data at scale and in an accessible manner. And the question that we pose ourselves is, how do we build something that can handle all three of those things? And how do we build it in a way that we can actually maintain this? And the short and somewhat disappointing answer for the day is, I don't think it's possible, at least not at our scale, to build something that does all three. Um, so end of talk, uh, we can't do it. Uh, you know, of course, um, we found one way to do it, and that's the way. That way is not to try to do all three parts ourselves, but to find open source versions we can work with, specifically for storage and visualization, and just building on top of those. And our thinking there is building on top of OMSRs as the upcoming standard for bioimage data that Puha now very nicely introduced, and then building on viewers like the Napari viewer, VSAR, um, these kind of tools for visualization, um, while we focus on building a framework that allows users to apply processing at scale uh, to their OMSR datasets. So 
how does the processing aspect of Fractal actually work? Um, today, I will guide you through this five-step overview. Um, we've been working with a lot of high content image data, and typically that means we get huge piles of individual images, like TIFF files, for example, from the microscope. Our processing always means converting everything into an OMSR first, and then applying different processing to this OMSR. Could be some processing on the image level, um, some flood field correction or such, could be some segmentation, uh, applying some measurements to the data, and preparing everything in a way that we can still interactively visualize even large data amounts. And then Fractal's job is how we orchestrate this um, to the scale of terabytes, but also to keep this accessible with a web interface for users so they can control what kind of workflow they want to run, which parameters they want to tune. And I'll now go through those five steps, ending with a short live demo in the end to show you how the framework actually looks. <coughs> so why convert to MSR? I'll keep this very short as we've um, heard it from Bucha in, in the beginning. Um, but for us, the main mo four motivations I'll introduce is one, it's a community standard that's upcoming, but there's three big things that make this a really good format to jump on, even if the rest of the community wouldn't be jumping on them. The first one is the pyramidal data, the ability to access data at multiple resolutions, both during visualization, but also during processing. That can be a really valuable feature. The second one is um, a for having a format that really supports both uh, HPC setups as well as cloud setups well. And the third one, and maybe my favorite part of the format is that with OMSRs, we now have a format that has very standardized ways of storing it and having metadata. Um, and it's the same format, whether we have 2D data, 3D data, multi-channel data, or time-resolved data, or any subset of those. We always use the same container and same metadata structure to make it work for a much broader set of image data. But with that, let's assume we got into OMSRs. We used one of the converters that Pucha uh, mentioned in the beginning, for example. How do we apply processing to OMSRs? And for us, it all comes down to modular processing units that we call tasks. And these tasks are basically Lego pieces um, that can be arranged in any way. And every task takes an OMSR as input and any parameters the user might need to give, does whatever processing is required, and puts the result back in the same or in a new OMSR container so that everything stays in this in this shared and standardized format. We've started building up a set of those processing tasks to really explore whether we can do different kind of processing in OMSRs. And so far, we've not hit things that we couldn't figure out how to process. Here's a list of examples of things we've built tasks for so far. They can be image processing like projections or flat field corrections, applying neural network for segmentation, um, applying different measurements, registration for multiplexed imaging, and a few more things. I'll showcase two of those tasks to give a bit of an idea of how that would look in practice and highlight some of the benefits of the OMSR format we see when, when using it for this processing. Um, the first one is when we want to do segmentation, um, we might want to do segmentation of very large objects. Um, we've worked a lot with images of organoids, for example, so big clumps of cells. And for those, we typically want to run some segmentation at a relatively low resolution, um, but we might need to have a custom retrained model. And what has been working surprisingly well for us is uh, retraining some cell pose models to recognize those full organoids. But then we can save a lot of processing time um, by not running this at full resolution of our image data, but actually at a lower resolution of the pyramid, which runs much faster and is very robust in then finding the large objects. On the other hand, though, sometimes we don't want to just get an overview. We really want to zoom in to 3D data and in 3D images find individual nuclei or individual cells, and then we also use a cell pose model for this, um, but now we really um, load much, much smaller amounts of the data at a time at a very high resolution in 3D instead of 2D. And the format makes it really easy to then decide which resolution level do you want to be at um, and which resolution level will your result be at. 
A second thing we do in processing is apply measurements. And the way we do this is uh, use either some custom tasks or we have a wrapper to run the Napari workflow framework, which can generate tables of measurements, let's say the area of your objects, their intensity, some more statistics on, on the signal. And these tables we can put into the end data format, which actually can be stored as part of a SAR file. So it can be part of the same container um, that we have our image data and our segmentation in. It can now also contain measurement data um, for the objects in those images. So an example workflow for how this will typically go um, is that we might have a big pile of 3D images, let's say a terabyte or two of 3D images. We convert those to an OMSR and we make a projection to get a 2D view of our data. And then in this 2D view, we apply um, cell pose models at low resolution to just find the individual organoids, find that here's one and here's one and here's one. And maybe we want to do some measurements on those. And in some scenarios, that's all we needed. And in other scenarios, for each of those objects we found at low resolution, we then go into high, re high resolution 3D and apply 3D segmentation um, within these organoids to find the individual cells. And for each of those cells, we can then make measurements again or do further processing. That is the very brief summary of getting from image data to processed image data. Um, now the question is, what do we do with these containers of processed image data? And I'll show two cases of visualization for them. Um, I'll show them using the Napari viewer. Um, why the Napari viewer? On the one hand, it's a great modern Python viewer with really active development and a great set of core developers, and also really has an active plugin system one of those plugins being support for OMSRs. So what you're seeing here is using this Napari OMSR plugin and streaming in the data of a multi-well plate. And this whole plate at full resolution would be about 100 gigabytes of data. So way too much to load at once. But as Buga mentioned before, um, we can now just stream the resolution we need so like when we go through Google Maps, when we zoom into a region, we start loading higher and higher resolution image data or label data if we have uh, made segmentation and just stream it in dynamically only to the region that we zoom into, uh, thus getting access to both our high resolution image data, but also having an easy way for someone to browse a large experiment and be able to explore are there biases between my wells in the multi-well plate? Did my segmentation work in one place? Did it also work in the other place? And really make large data amounts more accessible and more something a user can, can browse to explore and something they don't need to wait for hundreds of gigabytes of data to load for the viewer, but just streaming in dynamically as we do it. Everything you see here is using um, the current uh, main version of Napari, which has a bit of better support for this asynchronous loading and the Napari OMSR plugin. The second thing we can do using Napari is actually use some plugins to do a bit of more processing. And the really cool thing here is that I mentioned in the beginning that we have image data, segmentation, and measurements in this same container. So we can actually make use of that. And one of them is a little classification plugin we have where a user just clicks on individual cells. Let's say they click on mitotic cells and they click on some interface cells, which is quite easy for us to visually pick out in an image. Um, but we can then use both the segmentation and the measurements that were made before while processing this data set to train a little random forest classifier. So have a little uh, machine learning model that tries to classify all of the cells the user didn't click and assign them the same classification. And this can then become very interactive because a user can check what is the prediction of my classifier, add some annotation, retrain it until they're happy with it, and then really link the image data to the measurements that were made before. So that gets us uh, once through the cycle from images to the viewer. Last thing I briefly want to cover is how do we make this processing both scale and accessible? 
Um, and for that, um, in the fractal framework, everything centers around having a fractal server. And then users have two ways to interact with this. <laughs> they can either use a command line client to script interaction and automate some things. But actually, what most of our users use is the web interface, where um, they log in and then interactively build a workflow and submit those. And once a user has a workflow that they want to submit, um, it can either be run locally on a local machine, um, or it can be submitted to a Slurm cluster where we can then really scale up to process terabytes of data. And now, instead of showing you a movie of how this looks, I'll uh, try a little live demo, what could go wrong. Um, so this is how um, Fractal Web looks. Um, it's just running locally on my machine here um, to avoid some of potential pitfalls for the demo. Um, we have a list of projects, and we can do uh, Euro bio imaging demo project. And in this project, we have two things. We have data sets and workflows. Data sets are our way to describe where is our input data. We have image data that I put in a little folder. It's just a little public Zenodo data set. For this little demo, it's a trivial data set of, I think, four or eight images or so. And we say, well, the output of this, let's just put it on our desktop. Um, and make it a SAR. So we have input outputs. We could now manually start to create a workflow, but for time reason, let's just import an existing demo workflow um, from a little JSON file. Um, this gets us into the workflow view where we can see the sequence of different tasks that are run. So in this case, we would create a new MSR, uh, convert our data from the Yokogawa microscope into this OMSR, make a copy um, and then a projection into that copy. So we have a second 2D OMSR and on that one run cell pose and run some measurements. For each of those tasks, uh, we have parameters to, for example, decide what, uh, what parameters the network gets. And each of those parameters comes with some help text. Uh, we could add more tasks uh, by just picking any of the installed tasks. Let's say we want to do some registration. We would just add that task uh, to the workflow. But for now, let's just run this little demo workflow from our input to our output and send it off. Sending it off here means processing it uh, locally on my machine, could also mean being sent off to a cluster. And what actually happens now is that um, it will create a folder on my desktop eventually. Um, <laughs> And in that folder, we will start to see um, the OMSR appearing, uh, which we can then just drag and drop into a viewer to see what's happening. So here we start to get our output folder. Um, as seen before on the command line, an OMSR, especially those plate OMSRs, have some hierarchy of rows and columns. And then this is an actual OMSR image. And this consists of pyramid levels, tables, and optionally also labels. Um, that we save. We have a 3D version, and we also make a 2D version. This just contains a projection of our 3D OMSR um, that will then also get labels once we've run um, the cell pose model on them. We can monitor. I think it's still running in the moment. Um, soon we'll have this task finished, and then we can add this to an Apari viewer I opened over here. I think we now saw the labels folder appear. So now we have some segmentation. Uh, currently we have some ROI tables. Soon we'll have some measurement tables. So one after the other, our results will come streaming in. Mm -hmm. um, while we wait for that, the other part of Fractal Web that can be nice is a management of what are available tasks, what could be processed. I think the workflow just finished. So. Let's dive into that. Yeah, we have a finished workflow. Let's drag and drop our OMSR into the Napari viewer, open it with Napari OMSR, and we can now browse both the image data um, that we just processed, as well as the results of the segmentation that were made, and realize that actually, for this case, I think cell did a pretty really good job in finding our individual nuclei. This is a short tour of the fractal framework. Now to wrap it up and leave some time for question, um, 
few points to the end. Uh, biggest one is Fractal is very much under active development. Um, we're developing everything in the open. And um, now all Fractal packages come with a permissive uh, BST3 open source license. So you're very welcome to follow along, to check out our packages, open issues if you start noticing something or reach out. Uh, you can find everything here with a little overview page and instructions on how you could run the server yourself if you wanted to. Um, last part is a little shout out. I saw that there are multiple people attending uh, our next generation biomedical analysis workflow hackathon this November. Um, very much looking forward to this. This one is currently booked out already. Um, we already also have a kickoff symposium in November with a great lineup of speakers coming. Um, the in-person part is booked out, but next week we will announce uh, a virtual participation options for it. So have a look at this site next week uh, if you're interested to hear more people talk about image analysis. And with that, I would like to thank all of the people that made this possible, especially the people in the Liberali and Pelkman's lab um, over the past two years and our development team at Exact Lab that has really been working on building uh, the Fractal framework, as well as all the, um, all the parts that funded uh, this nice project.